chill, relax. You do not need to know what you're going to do right away. Pick two or maybe three things that if they can get these right, all the rest won't matter. I am thrilled to have on the show today, Mark Randolph co-founder and the founding CEO of Netflix. I think a few people know that brand. Mark, welcome to the show. Well, thanks very much. Pleasure to be here. And we were uh, just talking about our competing bookshelves. And, um, <laughs> and I said that, uh, well, I'll have to move some over, right? After I do the edits, that they look a little bit more balanced. So uh, I, uh, to celebrate this show, I, uh, I actually just binged on Netflix. So... Uh, <laughs> I'm glad that you made the exception in your normal habits to try and. Uh, yeah, exactly. I just, uh, I literally, I, I, I actually thought it would be quite funny to do that. So for the hour before this, I went upstairs and um, I watched some old Breaking Bad episodes. Why not? Right. Yeah, so, sure. <laughs> um, now, yeah, exactly. Now um, you, you've done tons, obviously, uh, aside from uh, Netflix, definitely going to be talking about Netflix. Um, you've also started a new, um, you also have your, you know, your podcast, which flows from your book, uh, That Will Never Work. You told me a little bit about it. I thought that was amazing what you just told me. So please, can you expand upon that? Tell us about this new podcast. Well, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm one of those people who kind of always likes to be challenged. So I like to plunge into things I know nothing about and figure it out. Um, and yeah, that was, I decided that would be a podcast this time, but it sprang from something pretty organic, which is that for years, pretty much ever since I left Netflix, I've been spending time working with other early stage entrepreneurs, basically trying to give them the confidence, the nudge, the tough love, whatever it is they need to try and take their business to the next step. And I would do that in the phone. But what I realized is people would be calling me up and asking similar questions and I said, well, listen, uh, there should be a way to make this a bit more scalable. I'm going to start recording some of these conversations. And then if someone else calls in, I'll say, hey, listen to this conversation. And uh, I found out something interesting about it, which is, you know, first of all, that people did find it helpful. A lot of entrepreneurs struggle with the same thing. There's some very, very common stumbling blocks that we all face. Uh, the second thing that was great was that it turns out that people really appreciated finding out that other people were in the same place they were. You know, entrepreneurship at its heart is a lonely thing. Um, you're trying to solve problems that haven't been solved before. You're doing it for the most part uh, by yourself. And letting people know there's a community of people who are all working on the same sort of thing was valuable. But the other unexpected part was that it turns out these uh, conversations were entertaining. I mean, these people have really interesting, eclectic businesses from all kinds of strange backgrounds. And it began going to these really interesting places. You know, when I, and so the podcast is essentially me mentoring other early stage entrepreneurs. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. And what's, um, so what's one thing from, from, from the episodes that you've done so far and from all the entrepreneurs that you've already, um, uh, you know, mentored and worked with, what's one thing that you would say that entrepreneur, that most entrepreneurs do, but that they shouldn't be doing? Oh, it, it's, there's a, listen, I can make a list. We could go on for hours about that list, but the, probably one of the common ones is people are too, are not focused. Right. Inherently, when you're starting a company, there is a hundred things that are broken. There's a hundred things that need work. Mm -hmm. And one of the errors is to believe I have to do all of them. And what you end up doing is having a hundred things, all of which are done about 10% well. And what I've realized is a common denominator common denominator, not just in my own startups, but in the ones that I do see where people are successful getting past these early stages is there have this ability to pick two or maybe three things that if they can get these right, all the rest won't matter. Ooh, uh, and that. yeah, it's a, really a, a form of business triage. Uh, and it's hard because a lot of the times the things that are the critical components are not the ones that are obvious. They're not the ones that are crying out the loudest. They're not the ones where the fire is the hottest. They could be sitting quietly on the side and you've got to have this intuition to recognize that's the one and then have the discipline and the courage 
to focus on them at the expense of all others. That's, and what makes it yeah, tricky yeah. is they're different in every business. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, well, I, I, absolutely. But it's as you're talking there, just you just reminded me of, I think the book was called The Four Disciplines of Execution. And I think in that book, they talk about um, this framing question, which goes something along the lines of, um, when you're looking at all the things that you could do, if, if you were to suppose that everything were to remain the same, just as it is right now, where's the one area or what's the one thing where change would have the most positive impact? And, yeah. and, I, and it just, I, I connect that immediately to what you're saying, because uh, it's, it's what you're talking about is like two to three things. What, what we're ultimately talking about is like leverage, right? Where to focus our time to gain leverage. Yeah. And um, yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's funny because when people sometimes like to feel they came up with some unique truism just to mm -hmm. demonstrate how clever and smart they are. But I actually <laughs> think the opposite. I think when you come up with something and someone else goes, oh, this person calls it that, or this person calls it that, that's when you know you've actually stumbled on something which truly does resonate and truly is a positive factor. Uniqueness in many ways is not uh, is somewhat overrated. So yeah. I think the fact that other people have recognized the same thing is actually uh, quite um, confirming. Yeah, yeah, exactly, a good thing. So, so that's interesting. So let's apply that to Netflix in its beginnings. So there was a myriad of things that you could have been focused on to, um, to, to get Netflix started. What were in your mind the two to three things as a co-founder, founding, founding CEO? You know, what, what, how did you narrow your focus? Yeah, so what was clear to us was that we, the challenge for Netflix was that we were launching a DVD by mail business. So this was not streaming. Uh, this was taking movies and literally mailing them to people who on a DVD. So yeah. it was a pretty ridiculous idea, um, but it required one thing to work. There actually had to be people who owned DVD players and you yeah. had to find a way to reach them. If you did not have customers, uh, this would not obviously work at all. It was not as if we were entering into the VCR VHS space where 90 some odd percentage of households owned a player. So the challenge for us, the one thing we had to get right was figure out some mechanism to actually reach people. So in this case, it was marketing. How do we acquire customers? And the secondary one was this differentiation that we knew we were going to be going up against Blockbuster, that every Blockbuster was going to be basically a, a stone's throw away from anyone's house. And we had to give them some compelling reason why they would want to wait for us to mail them a movie when they could drive down the street and get it. And yeah. so the second thing we focused very much on was, uh, I won't call it content, but on fulfilling this promise that we would make it easier to discover great stories for people. Amazing. And so on, on that first one, then going a little bit deeper on that, so customer acquisition and the marketing. So if we take that another level down, so the two to three things there um, that you know, brought the, the focus to that bucket of activities, what, what did you do there? So what was the challenge here is that we realized that most marketing techniques weren't going to work. You certainly couldn't use general advertising because then 99.99% of your money would be wasted since so few household owned a DVD player. And so the first strategy was to find people where they congregated, which at the time, this was in 1998, was in user groups, was in these unique little clusters, uh, communities on the web. Um, and we had someone and uh, he called himself the director of black ops because what he would do was infiltrate these user groups uh, and he'd begin posting things like, Hey, I just heard about this really cool company, which supposedly has every single DVD available called Netflix. Has anyone heard of it? And then he'd go to it and then oh, he'd engage so in a awesome. conversation. And of course, now that's a fairly common and frowned upon thing. Yeah, yeah. But at the time was our way of spreading our word among that community. But the big breakthrough was realizing that we shared a problem with the DVD manufacturers because they were desperately trying to sell DVD players and their customers were saying, why would I buy a DVD player when 
there aren't any DVDs available. My blockbuster mm. doesn't have a single DVD. Mm. And uh, the DVD, the, most places weren't stocking DVDs because there's no DVD players. And we realized that we could solve this chicken and egg problem for them. And we approached, we, I approached these consumer electronics companies with this offer. We would put a coupon in the box that everybody who buys your DVD player will immediately get 10 free rentals so that they'd be able to communicate. If you buy this player, there's content available. Mm -hmm. And I make it sound like, oh, I just went out and did this, but it was brutal because what you have is Silicon Valley company, grossly negative balance sheet, barely in business for, been in business for weeks, not even months, and wanting to do a deal with some of the most conservative companies in the world yeah. and convincing them to put a sticker on the box or a coupon in the box required that I travel to the wilds of suburban New Jersey office parks, <laughs> camped out and traipsing from Toshiba to Sony to Panasonic using all the powers of persuasion I had to convince him to do a deal with us. And eventually though, we eventually had a coupon in virtually every single DVD player sold. And that really, I won't say it solved the problem, but it allowed us to have a customer flow that allowed us to then turn our attention to, okay, what's the next big crisis? And that's a great segue to, um, because you, know, you started uh, offering something different compared to what Blockbuster was doing in terms of your distribution model and not having to rely on you know, so much in terms of bricks and mortar and all of that. But then of course, there's another industry crisis which emerges, which is the DVD becomes dead or it's, its death is on the horizon. Um, can you take us through, because that, that's just an incredible transition for, that, for the company to have navigated. Um, and can you take us through that? It's from DVD to streaming, I, th I assume yeah. you're assuming too. Yeah, yeah. Well, so first of all, this was basically, yes, if streaming is on the horizon, we're in a rowboat. In other words, that horizon is uh, almost infinitely far away. Uh, and so I'll be quite honest that there was not this consideration on day one. Oh my gosh, what are we going to do? Uh, it's just imminent. Uh, that's not to saying that that wasn't a fairly common opinion. And in fact, you know, the reason why my book is called That Will Never Work, and the reason why the podcast is called That Will Never Work, and the reason why the clubhouse room is That Will Never Work, etc., was because that is what I have always heard, but I specifically heard it all the time when I was pitching people this idea of doing DVD rental by mail. And to your point, there was two things that everyone brought up when they said, why won't this work? And one of them was Blockbuster, of course, is one in every corner. Yeah. But the other one was hey, DVD. That's a digital media. Um, just a matter of time before everyone is downloading movies or stream movies. So who's going to want DVDs then? And, you know, here's the thing is they were right, just like you're right, that it's inevitable that eventually the DVD is going to go away and it's going to transition to streaming. But I was not so sure it was going to be as imminent as people thought. Uh, there was a lot of reasons why this horizon was pretty far off in the uh, in the distance. And when you I mean, say it, far off, when you say far off in the distance, like what what was the differential between how far you thought it was versus how how far everyone else thought it was? I mean, I think a lot of people said this is a simple, a pretty simple matter. It's digital, so you just download it. Okay. And you go, no, it's not so simple. I mean, first of all, there's digital rights management issues because the industry is still reeling from being Napstered. Uh, if I can use that, that as a verb. Uh, in addition, the bandwidth to the home uh, is terrible. And so yeah. th it's not going to be easy to do right now. And number three, that for the times that the, uh, if you do have bandwidth to the home, it's terminating at your office, your home office. It's not terminating in your living room on your television. But the biggest one is Hollywood is almost as conservative as the consumer electronics industry. And they were saying, why on earth would we want to give away movies digitally and risk the rest of this? So for what I get, I, make, I can make a million or two dollars a year and risk eight billion dollars a year. Yeah. So there was a lot of reasons people were cynical. I mean, I mean, some people they were saying, no, it's a matter of months. I was pretty sure it was a matter of years, but that was the challenge at with the challenge of how do you manage a transition, which you know is coming but you have no idea when it's coming. Yeah. 
And for us, it meant how do you position the company correctly? Because we could have come out and said, Netflix, the world's fastest shipper of plastic. Yeah. Um, or whatever the positioning was around DVDs, yeah. which would have been a great positioning for a time when DVDs were almost impossible to find. But to your point, eventually that's going to go away. But it also would have been equally flawed to say Netflix is the streaming solution uh, because it would have been a solution which was dripping you know, one drop at a time for years. So instead, one of the cleverest things I think we did was position ourselves as delivery agnostic which is we're going to position ourselves as the place to discover great stories yes. because that works for DVD perfectly, but it also works when you're in streaming and it will also work in 10 or 15 years when we can beam it, I don't know, telepathically into your fillings or something like that. But it, it, it means that the way you thought about Netflix, every piece of brand equity that we built in day one, week one, month one, year one, was equity that carried over. We were yeah. learning what customers liked, but we had to make it real, which was why we made the investment from day one, having every single DVD that was available, which is why we began to do all the work we did on doing the taste algorithm um, uh, software. It's why we spent all this time on content so that by the time that horizon arrived nine years later, that we were in a position where we already had tens of millions of very, very happy subscribers who didn't need to think about Netflix differently. Yeah. It was, we're the same Netflix. You still come to us for what to watch. We're yeah. just giving you a different option of how to get it to you. Yeah. And because you're still upholding, what was, what was the, the vision or the purpose statement again? Uh, help you discover great stories. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So since you're still true to that, the manifestation of it didn't matter as it changed over time. And people, people, you know, with this current jumping to the present, where now you have dozens of companies who are all competing uh, in the streaming business, Netflix's lead doesn't just come from the amount of dollars they spend on content. It comes from the fact that since 2007, so for 13, 14 years, we've had that experience of establishing a direct relationship with all of these consumers who think of us a certain way. Whereas mm. all the companies entering streaming for the first time have to begin figuring those things out starting now. So the head start is pretty significant in, in, in the fact that we've really had a chance to understand customers and build relationships with them. Fantastic. And I just noticed this, like maybe a, it was a couple of weeks ago or so on Netflix. It's probably been there for ages and I only just noticed it now, but yeah, uh, there was a little prompt next to the rating and it just simply said, you know, the more you rate, uh, you know, I think the better your uh, recommendations are. And, uh, and I just thought that was clever because, um, because I read that I had never rated and I've been watching Netflix for years. I had never rated until I saw that prompt. And then the moment I saw that, I thought, Oh yeah, maybe I should set press and thumbs up or thumbs down, right? And to get exactly what you're saying, so you know, the content that's a little bit more, um, you know, tailored to me. I love the, um, you know, I love the, I love the per when we were when we were uh, building Skype. Our tagline was the whole world can talk for free, right? And, um, and and it worked, and and it was relatively true until we started to charge people for connecting to the telephony network. <laughs> <laughs> but but um, it was relatively true and it was, uh, you know, it was something that inspired us. And then uh, 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 another example from my own life would be um, uh, after that, I, I built a, um, a chain of Mexican restaurants and, and the, the, uh, the tagline there was uh, we, were, we weren't selling burritos. That, you know, that's, that's what all the competition was doing. Uh, we were making the world a more vibrant place. And of course, we did that, you know, through, you know, adding flavor to people's lives uh, and, you know, various other things. But I'm just a huge fan of coming up with those. It, it's almost like internal branding as, as well as external, where oh, your workforce it's is so largely internal. Yeah. It's, I think it's more important to be branded internally because especially once the company begins to achieve some success and has lots of people, because what you're looking for is people to be able to make independent judgments about what's appropriate and what's not, what's not appropriate. And they need yeah. to have this filter. They can say, I have a choice. I'm literally sitting here composing something and I can pick two words. 
I don't want to have to go ask my supervisor. I want to have an internal compass that tells me which is the more appropriate choice. And so having everyone understand what the real reason for being for an organization is, I think is a critical one. Yeah. And, and those yeah. are good. I mean, it's, it's the classic marketing challenge of saying, you know, we're not in the trucking business. We're in the transportation business. You know, exactly. we're not in the oil business. We're in the energy business uh, yeah. because it allows you to be somewhat, I won't say future proof, but it certainly allows you to recognize changes that's happening and be prepared to adapt to it and recognize that you still stand for the same thing. Uh, yeah. You just have different ways of providing it. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. I want to go, I want to connect back to your podcast. I want to connect back to, um, um, you know, that will never work and the work that you're doing with entrepreneurs. Cause I think there's something particularly inspirational about you, which I can relate to as well. Cause I've just done like, you know, a lot of like, you know, quite random things. Well, as I said, you know, Skype and then, you know, chain of Mexican restaurants, very random. And, um, and the sky's really the limit, right? With people's potential. But a lot of people don't truly appreciate that. And a lot of people think that you need certain, you have to have like a set of prerequisites in order to do something else. And to go back to you on this, I think a lot of people would be surprised to find out that your educational background, it wasn't, it wasn't based in business at all, right? It was, um, it was a geolo had, geology major. Yeah, exactly. So geology um, and you went to, was it Hamilton College? Hamilton, liberal arts school, right? Liberal arts school. I, I went to University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. You know, it wasn't, it's was a good school. It's not like an Ivy League school. Um, and your first job, it was, was it a sheet music company? Cherry, yeah, Cherry Lane exactly. Music? Yeah. Yeah. And you were in charge of a mail order operation. Is that right? Yeah, that, which is a glorified way of saying, uh, I basically took self-addressed stamped envelopes and stuck song lists in them and mail them out. Yes. I was in charge of their mail order division. Yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, one of my, you know, first jobs, like I, I literally, I stood at the door of a bar and, and kept unruly people from coming in and throwing, you know, uh, the same people out. So it's, um, you know, humble, you know, humble beginnings, um, uh, certainly not at all related to, you know, top, you know, media empire company, you know, a tech company as well. Um, so how did you go from those beginnings to, to founding, you know, Netflix? It's funny. I, you know, I, I actually wrote a, wrote a blog post for my, my blog of, I don't know, maybe a month or two ago, and which was basically kind of advice to young graduates, which was chill relax. You do not need to know what you're going to do right away. I mean, if you do, you're lucky. I do have some friends, you know, some of my kids' friends, you know, they're six years old. And I go, I want to be a veterinarian. And then, holy crap, you know, 20 years later, they're a veterinarian. But that is so <laughs> yeah. unbelievably rare. For the most of us, we stumble around uh, totally. gathering experiences totally. until you end up in the right place. And listen, my background was was no different. The, the, the job prior to me being the uh, direct running the direct direct marketing division of the music sheet music company was I was basically a gopher uh, for the CEO. I mean yes. now it has this glorified term which is called chief of staff. Yeah. But no, it's it's a gopher. You walk around behind somebody with a pad, and every time they say, "Bill, get me those numbers on Wednesday," you write, "Make sure Bill gets some of the numbers on Wednesday." Or when the CEO <laughs> goes to them, "I'll get back to you on Thursday." He'll make sure he gets back to month. That was my job, but. <laughs> So this is not earth shattering stuff. This is not something you brag about, but wow, is it educational? I mean, yeah. the best possible thing you can do is if you want to be in some career and some business is not to pick the dream job and fight like crazy to get it. It's to get your foot in the door any way you can, just so you can see what goes on. What do people really do? What's the vocabulary? How do they organize? How do they accomplish things? And following a CEO around all day, I got to learn a lot about how someone like that thinks, but the real, the, the, the break of the break was uh, it was a music publishing company that had lots of divisions and they had this one division, which was a mail order division, which basically was in the back of every, and by the way, this is sheet music. This is yeah. little books that are yeah. like uh, Beatles for auto harp or like yeah. Led Zeppelin for French horn, you know, and, and in the back of every songbook was a yeah. little tagline that said, for a list of more great Cherryland songbooks, send a self-destructed envelope to P.O. Box so-and-so. 
And then awesome. this job that I was dying to get that I even asked the CEO if I could have was basically yeah. when these stamped envelopes came in, I would Xerox the list of the more great Jerry Lane songbooks and mail it to them. And if an order came back, I'd pick, pack it and ship it myself in the warehouse. But the awesome. thing is, you stumble onto stuff. And when I began doing that, I was transfixed and began experimenting. You know, it's what happens if we do a color Xerox? How about two pages? What if I do a catalog, a mailing? Yeah. And basically taught myself direct response marketing and realized that at heart, that deeply resonated with me, that the art and science combined of direct marketing spoke to me. And then I spent the next 10 years as a direct marketing guy. I started my first three startups, whereas mail order companies and magazines yeah. and mail order companies, of course, is direct response. You're sending out catalogs. You're doing direct response. Uh, can you, order. Mark, can you can, j j just to help our listeners, can you just give a, a simple definition of direct response marketing and what that actually means? Certainly. Mark, so the marketing uh, basically is trying to communicate with customers to incent them to do something. But largely when you have marketing like on the side of a bus or on a billboard or a space advertisement, you're just trying to plant an impression in someone's head and eventually they'll get around to doing it. In direct response, you want them to respond right then and there directly back to you. And so what it does is make it measurable. Mm. So you can actually do tremendously sophisticated experimentation. And when I eventually was doing direct marketing for a big software company, I would just melt people's minds because I would say, no, listen, we've done this test and this blue envelope responds better than the red envelope. And the software engineers would say, that makes no sense. Why would any, why would it make a difference in making a decision of what software to buy, whether the mailing piece came in a blue envelope or red envelope, this is ridiculous. And I go, well, let's look at the data. And that would then cause this creative, this huge cognitive dissonance in their head about <laughs> it can't be true, but the data, but the, and yeah, boom, yeah. It has exploded. It's like they can't suspend their disbelief. <laughs> Correct. But that's why it was fascinating. And it's interesting talking about these 10 years in direct marketing because you go, what, what's the point of that? Well, the point of it was twofold. Number one is I loved it. I was yeah. following this passion. It gave me this outlet for this deep analytical thinking, which I like, coupled with the creativity that goes in direct marketing. But when, wow, look what happened. All of a sudden the internet comes along. I know, it's perfect for this. Last 10 years doing direct response marketing, realizing what it's capable of, what it's incapable of, and sees this new medium where you can sell things and get direct responses back and do personalization to a level we had only dreamed of in the direct marketing industry. Yeah. And I said, that's where I'm going. Yeah, so, that's, that's a beautiful segue. Cause it's like, it's because it, it just goes, it, it fits so perfectly with Netflix's approach and, you know, uh, what about marketing and also too, like when you think about direct response and what you're saying, I mean, you know, when you think about that from an internet perspective, it's, it's kind of like, yeah, duh, of course you need an A-B test and, you know, to change colors and graphics and statements and all that stuff. But what's beautiful about this is that few people probably realize that that was going on in the physical world in direct response marketing well before the internet was even thought of. Right. That, that, that's, why, that's why I love the fact that you brought up the fact, what were you doing beforehand because this whole message about chill, relax, is yeah. you never know what your life is preparing you for and what, you, and what the skill is not no, predicting 10 years in advance what skill I want. Let's go to school for that skill. It's recognizing an opportunity that may match your skill set. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and that's what happened. And having this ability to really understand testing, to really understand AB, to really understand what makes people respond. And that allowed me to take advantage of this new medium for it. But here's the, here's the other thing. This is to show you that I'm not necessarily 2%. I'm probably you know, maybe 13 or 14%, <laughs> which is that I mentioned offhand that I launched magazines. And magazines have a big component for selling magazines called subscription. Uh, yeah. And so I really understood subscription marketing oh, as well. Oh, this is so good. 
Yeah. <laughs> so keep going. And well, and you, you, well, you, of course, you jumped ahead to where this story is going. Yeah. But the reason I say I kick myself is that when we launched Netflix, it never occurred to me that I could do subscriptions as well. Uh, that took a year and a half for me to oh, really? test it. Yeah. That, you know, when you look back and you go, what's the biggest contributions? I shouldn't say that. What are some of the real breakthroughs that Netflix pioneered? Uh -huh. And certainly streaming is a big one. But I think that almost a bigger one is that we were one of the first companies to demonstrate you could apply a subscription model to something other than magazines or record and tape clubs. Yeah. That you could actually sell things which were completely non-intuitive uh, to sell via subscription. And if you look what's happening now, certainly in the software industry, well, and even in the consumer package goods industry, we're seeing subscription models being applied almost universally. Very, very few software companies launch now that aren't SaaS businesses. Yeah. So it, yes, these yeah. things, you know, you never, you go circulate, <clears throat> magazine circulation. Yeah, <laughs> some things end up being useful that you never anticipated. Yeah, it's so, so, so awesome. And, and um, and I, I, I love what you're talking about too, when, when it comes to, Hey, chill, you don't need to, and I don't know if that was intended, you know, Netflix uh, and chill. But, <laughs> no, that wasn't actually, but that's, that's funny. But, but I thought that was pretty clever <laughs> if it was, but it wasn't fine. Cool. But um, um, when you were talking about, um, um, oh, I lost my train of thought. Yeah. When you're talking about, yeah, ch chilling, like not needing to figure it out. And I think too, for those listening and, um, you know, it's not that you don't even need to figure it out in the first instance. You don't need to have it all figured out for the whole way through because you just need to just keep, you know, I, 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 case in point, I graduated with a degree in finance. I worked at a bar after that. Uh, then I, I, I ended up working as a consultant with McKinsey and company. Didn't you know, think that was going to happen. Suddenly that happened. Um, then, you know, help build Skype, then built a chain of Mexican restaurants. And now I, you know, I uh, invest and advise in various, you know, entrepreneurs and companies. And the other day, somebody asked me, how did you plan that all out? And I, I laughed so hard as I planned that all out. There, there was no planning. It just kind of happened. And you respond to the opportunities. You respond to Oh, this interests me. I want to, you know, really learn about this, acquire the knowledge, acquire, you know, whatever is needed to get going within that area. And then you try it out and you see what works and, and you kind of just, right. You, it's almost like, it's almost like you're taking a direct response marketing approach to your own life. You just AB test and you see where's the blue envelope, <laughs> you know, right. You, know, you just made a connection that I've never really made before for me, which is, I am a big believer that as a young person on earth, who cares at any age, you shouldn't be necessarily trying to overly plan your life. You just need to be open to experiences and recognizing how to apply those experiences. But it's the exact same advice that I give using different words to entrepreneurs, which is that you do not need to know where this business is going. And in fact, yeah. the more time you try and figure out in advance where it's going, all you're doing is stalling the process of actually learning where it wants to go on its own. Yeah, yeah, that, exactly. And I, I've never really made that connection before, but it's, it's exactly the same thing. It, this it, stop dreaming about what your company is going to become because you're almost inevitably wrong. You can't, it's impossible. They have their own life. It's there's too many forks in the road to predict them. You've got to just start and see where it goes. It's almost like as we're talking about it right now, it's almost like it's uh, it echoes just, you know, Darwin's natural selection, right? Where, <laughs> you know what I mean, right? Yeah, absolutely. Where, where, where there's no, there's no real, there's no, um, at a unit level, there's no intelligent decision-making as to which choice is being made in the natural selection maze, but the intelligence is kind of in the collection of choices and in the system and it kind of all works out. Right. So. When I, when I mentioned, you mentioned earlier that what I loved about um, direct marketing and direct response was the combination of art and science. Uh, it's the exact same thing that I love about, the entrepreneurship because when you're testing something you know explicitly or empirically whatever the word is 
that the blue envelope is 0.003% better than the green yeah. envelope. But what you don't know is why should I, should I have tested envelope color? Should I have tested envelope size? Should I have tested the wording? In other words, you, you, I, I have 16,000 colors I could have chosen. Why those two? So there is this element of saying, let's try the noose with a blue skin on it. In other words, yes. you, you, you don't know which of these genetic uh, mutations are going to be the ones which do give the creature a leg up in the world, but you can yeah. narrow down just to make some educated guesses. And I think that's what makes it a skill is that yeah. a, an entrepreneur has this sense of what should I try? I don't know what's going to work. In fact, I know I'm probably going to be wrong, but I can narrow my choices and hopefully get close. Oh man. You, okay. Now my brain is, is a, because you just, you, you said, when you said the word elements, I literally thought of like the periodic table. This is going to get a little bit far out there. But I just thought, I thought for a second, I was like, well, we're building a unified principle of, uh, yeah, of something. Well, well there's the, he, something here. Listen to this. Okay. There's something here. So my mind just exploded because I just thought, you know, matter is neither created nor destroyed. Um, we have a set of elements. So, um, and then I thought of music for some reason. And I thought if you can have a collection of instruments, right, or a collection of elements, and I can make totally different music from the same set. I can have all the world's instruments in, in the same place. I can make a totally different set of music from the set of instruments. What are the two variables that change in terms of how the music sounds? It will be which elements that I choose and the sequencing of them. And then I think from a business point of view, you know, in its simplest form, it's, well, what are the different elements or the factors that you're going to put into your business and what's the sequencing of them? And at a elemental level, if I will, <laughs> if I may, it's, it comes down to that, right? It's Absolutely. sequencing it's, and choices. And, it, and it, it, it's, it's more sophisticated than that too, because there are these incremental um, tests, if I could, experiments you run, which are largely limited to the tool, the choices you have, and you're trying to rearrange them and change the order and change the timing and all yeah. those pieces. But then there's occasionally breakthrough thinking where yeah. someone says, why do I have to have uh, 11 notes in a scale or whatever it is, 12 notes in a scale? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What would happen if I did, or, you know, or even in music, you know, why does it always have to be four, four, three, four time? You know, that yes. you end up with, with yes. Pink Floyd stuff. It's like, um, uh, or Philip Glass at, at an extension. Um, and so you, you end up having this combination of breakthrough thinking combined with iterative process of refinement. Yeah. Provided, it's a fast, it's a, it's a fast, and, yeah. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, provided that the market will accept it. So I, I just thought uh, I'm going to start a new football league next year. And instead of a hundred yards, you know, it's going to be 120 yards for the field, but I don't know. I don't know if breaking that model will work. Oh, that's interesting. Isn't it? <laughs> Which it goes down to why, why that? Yeah. Is that because a hundred yards is the ideal? Was that a random luck? I don't know the history of football, but for example, did they iterate to that? Because believe me, there's some weird, weird fucking sports out there that, uh, yeah. and you and you play them, and you go, God, it actually works pretty well. How did they? Yeah, get exactly. To, yeah, get to, is that luck? Anyway, well, it's well let's, let, let's that's fascinating. Let's, let's trust that uh, the sports world has their individual kind of dimensions and rules and all that figured out. <laughs> now you mentioned earlier, you talked about, um, you anecdotally uh, talked about your kids. I have a, I have a 16 year old and a, and a seven year old boy, uh, two, two boys. You, you have three kids, right? I have three kids. I have two boys and a girl. Okay. Um, <clears throat> how really, Okay, be real here. What was work-life balance like in the beginning days of Netflix? And how did that change or did that change as the company evolved? So the, just to answer a question, you got to understand something, which is that Netflix wasn't my first startup. Netflix right. was my fifth startup. Right, I, I, was, okay. I was 38. So uh, there was some water under the bridge. So I made all my life balance mistakes before I had kids. I made all my life balance mistakes largely before I was married. Uh, and I, so I was able to correct them all uh, when it was important. 
Okay. Um, and and, and I'm, I listen, and when I use the words correct them all, it's personal. Everyone's sense of what balance mm. is. But for me, I recognize probably in my late 20s, early 30s that I didn't like the way I was going because mm. I was working all the time. Um, mm. And that was fine when I was by myself. But all of a sudden, I had a girlfriend, the woman who's now my wife, mm -hmm. and I kind of dawned on me that it is not really the basis of a good relationship here if she's getting the time that's left over after I pour everything I've got into my work. Uh, okay. The other thing about me is that I was lucky enough to recognize really early on that there's... This, that being outdoors is a huge part of what makes me whole mm -hmm. and what fulfills me. And I don't mean just going for a walk in the park. I mean, you know, um, alpine climbing or whitewater kayaking, Doing or surfing active. or mountain, but they, yeah, basically outdoors, chance of a visit to the hospital, I'm in. <laughs> the, the, okay, but, nice. but that kind of stuff is not what you do. I got 10 minutes for my next call. I think I'll head up to uh, and yeah. paddle uh, the no attack river. It doesn't yeah. work like that. Yeah. You, if you want to be able to get out, especially when you have a startup, which is demanding all of your time, especially when you have little kids who are demanding all your time, you've got to be good at it. But the work-life balance for me was something that I recognized I needed to put a lot of effort into it was not just going to happen. Um, and so I really tried very, very hard to make sure I was present for my wife. I uh, made, tried very hard to make sure I was present for my kids uh, and had to modify how do you run a startup and make time for that and be able to get out and do uh, the, the outdoor stuff that I wanted to do. And I That's think a lot of the cultural things that have since been kind of popularized at Netflix came not from grand design, but from necessity. Yeah. I have still to this day at, um, I have several alarms. I put little phrases in them on my phone, but uh, I have one that goes off at 6 30 PM every day. And uh, it says world's best husband and father. And it's just to prompt <laughs> the question, how would the world's best husband and father walks through that door right now. I'm not the world's best husband and father, but it's just to prompt that question, right? Yeah, um, that's because great. When you, that. Because when you take intentionality into that segment of the day, and you 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 more you, you're just way more deliberate with your actions, and I've found you're way more measured in your response. Because look, we all know when you have a family. There's things that happen at home that will kind of, you know, set you off potentially. And it's about your response. It's super important, right? Do you look backwards too? You oh. know what I mean? Do you, do you periodically say, okay, it's January 1st for last year. How did this work on this, on the, how did this, how did it go for I being do. I have, best husband and father? Yeah. Yeah. I, I get to the end of the year and I say, what went well, what didn't. Any insights, learnings is a four part thing I do. What went well? What didn't? Insights, learnings. Okay. What will I do next year differently as a result? So, yeah, yeah you do I, the same. That's or a value, similar? That's the, oh, absolutely. I yeah. do it on a very frequent schedule. I mean, I do it lightly once a week, yeah. once a month, once yeah, a quarter. Just get, and but it's not necessarily about, not about the best husband and father thing, but I, I, have, I have periodic goals I set for myself, usually around balance. Usually when I recognize something's going uh, askew in being productive, am I doing, am I working on the things I want to work on? Am I getting the right things done and looking back and saying, how did I do with that? Or, or, if you, or do you just have the fundamentals right? I mean, to, right. It's right. like two, two days ago, I was in a bit of a bad mood. Uh, you know, my, I was all, I, was, I, I wasn't in a good mood. And, and, and my wife says, Giselle says to me, she's like, oh. she's like, Eric, she's like, all you need, is a good night's sleep. <laughs> <laughs> and and there's, a, there's a great book, Why We Sleep. Um, Matthew Walker wrote it. And he has a great quote in the book. He says, uh, often the bridge between uh, hope and despair is eight hours of sleep. So there you go. <laughs> yeah. So. I think one of those valuable things is to be able to train yourself to go, the things that I'm worrying about at two o'clock in the morning yeah. are not as bad as they seem. Yeah, exactly. And, and that only comes from 
waking up in the morning and looking back at the thing you're worrying about and go, gosh, I was way uh, out of proportion. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So we got, we got our final stretch here and I just want to change the questions a little bit. We're talking, talking about generally like, you know, strategy and ways to think about things. And it's kind of like, you know, quite upbeat, I got to say, but um, life isn't always upbeat. Life's a roller coaster. We've got ups and downs. And um, one of my favorite proverbs, Japanese proverb, fall down seven times, stand up eight. And um, <clears throat> what, um, can you take us through some of your big down moments, that, well, even if it's just one down moments at Netflix or, or, or anything else, it doesn't need to be Netflix, you know, you, a, a low moment and what was going on in your head and more specifically, what did you do to climb out of the trough? I'll use a Netflix moment. Um, I mentioned earlier that uh, we eventually morphed to a subscription model. Uh, mm -hmm. And after a year and a half of flailing, we finally had this repeatable, scalable model. And Netflix took off. And uh, I won't go into it here for, in a time, but subscription models have tremendous positive benefits in that they end up generating revenue month after month after month yeah. after month. The downside is because of that predictability, you become comfortable spending acquisition costs way out of proportion to what you might get back that first month. In yeah. other words, they're extremely cash intensive businesses. Right. And so ours was taking off and it was sucking down cash like crazy. And then we had the dot-com meltdown and money, which up until that point had been trivially easy to obtain now became impossible. Mm -hmm. uh, dot com was a scarlet, were, were scarlet letters. Um, and we were pretty much about to go out of business and decided to do the thing you do when you're just about out of business, which as the, the euphemism, as you probably know, it is we're going to pursue strategic alternatives, which basically <laughs> means we got to sell this sucker. Yeah. Um, and our strategic alternative was Blockbuster. Uh, and it's, it's a longer story, which is covered in quite humorous detail in the book for those little plug right there. Yeah. But uh, we <laughs> ended up with us finally getting this meeting with Blockbuster, flying to Blockbuster, ending up in this cavernous conference room on the 27th floor of this Dallas skyscraper. And for reasons I'll explain in the book, I'm there in shorts and a t-shirt and flip-flops and the Blockbuster guys are in their fancy suits and expensive shoes. But we pitched to sell the company to them. Uh, and it's going great, uh, asking really good questions, leaning in. And then they say, how much? And Reed says, $50 million. Reed Hastings, my co-founder, $50 million. And I'm not quite sure what, I couldn't quite read what was going on, what the reaction was. And I realized they were trying not to laugh at this ridiculousness. And the meeting went down a little quickly after that. And the point you're curious about was on the plane home where it slowly begins to sink in that this meeting, which we had fought for months to get, which when we got it, we were sure was gonna be the meeting that saved us. It was so self-evidently the right thing to join these two companies together. But now, not only was Blockbuster not gonna save us, they were gonna compete with us. And we were hemorrhaging cash. And there was this sense of, oh my God, everything we worked on for the last, two and a half years, three years is done. There's no way out of this. And there is this reserve that comes from being an entrepreneur for so long, which teaches you to view every experiment that doesn't work as a learning about what doesn't work. And it just means I've now got to find something else that is going to work. Mm -hmm. And it was deep that hole. But what I kept thinking about was this is one of those problems. And I teach my kids this concept. There's no simple answer. There is no obvious answer that it's a circular problem. If you do this, well, then this is wrong. If you do this, then that's wrong. If you do this, well, that's wrong. And it keeps going around. Yeah, and once yeah, exactly. you realize that there's no right answer, there's no easy out, there's no simple solution, then all that's left is to turn and face it. And it's my father's advice used to be, you know, sometimes Mark, the only way out is through. 
Uh, and I think recognizing that's where we stood gave us this resolve to go back and realize we're not going to be saved by Blockbuster. We're not going to be saved by the VCs. We're not going to be saved by the consumer electronics companies. We have to save ourselves. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's awesome. When you look back, and I tell a lot of the entrepreneurs that I mentor this, I go, when you look back at your trajectory, the times you're going to remember the most are when it was the darkest, when you all rallied when you had this incredible sense of purpose. It's the same thing I love about rock climbing or mm. backcountry skiing or mountain biking or surfing. It's you have no choice but to be completely in the moment, meaning I've got to solve the problem in front of me. And there is something about what that does to you. And this was absolutely um, one of those moments. Mark, that is awesome. And, 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 and I, 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 I've read, you know, people have said, uh, you know, some of the stupidest, you know, stupidest business decisions ever and talk about how Blockbuster could have bought Netflix for 50 million. That right there though, creates an alternative universe. And I, like, I don't even believe in that because had they bought it for 50 million, I believe they would have just screwed the whole thing up because you guys, like that, that, that was never, it was never even a missed opportunity. It was, it was not a missed opportunity. My point is that was not a missed opportunity for them. And there certainly wasn't a missed opportunity for you. It was nothing more than a happening. And both sides took learnings from it. Um, and and yeah, I just think it's a beautiful, beautiful story. And uh, yeah, awesome, awesome. Yeah. What, what do you, uh, last question for you, Mark. Um, in the spirit of, um, so uh, by the way, people watching, listening, if you have not read That Will Never Work yet, stop this insanity, get the book. It's amazing. I mean, if you've just heard Mark speak, he's, he's uh, absolute, like, you know, a cauldron of, of wisdom. So, so get the book, check out the podcast, his podcast as well, That Will Never Work. But Mark, what do you, um, what do you believe, what would you say you believe that few others do, or what do you believe that other people don't generally? Uh, I believe probably the thing that I get the most pushback on is that I I'll jump to the punchline. I really believe that what I've done with companies is not special. Uh, I believe that people who start companies are not superhuman with these abilities far beyond those of mortal men. Um, there are big elements of luck in it, uh, but the skill set is something that fundamentally almost everybody has, uh, which is why my entire message can be boiled down to if you have an idea, you have a dream, try it. Stop thinking about it. Stop coming up with the reasons why you can't. The cleverness is not uh, dreaming about what's going to be. The cleverness is how can I figure out a way to quickly, cheaply, and easily start so I can learn whether it's a good idea or a bad idea. Um, and I spend so much time pushing people to do that. And when I say who doesn't believe in that, the big category who doesn't believe in it are all these people who have these dreams, but then say, well, I need to quit school or I need to raise money or I need a technical co-founder or I've got to learn to code or blah, 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 blah. I've heard every single possible excuse. Yeah. Uh, and so all I can do is keep trying to sit down with one person after another and say, let's talk about how you can take this idea and let's figure out a way by tomorrow that you can actually begin the process of learning whether in fact your idea actually has validity or not. And I actually had one person I spoke to who I respected a lot. And he said, I think, Mark, you were doing a tremendous disservice to people by encouraging people to do things that are going to fail. Really? And it was like, yeah, wow. he goes, he goes, I think these, I think most businesses fail. I think these are people, it, it's like the argument that says we shouldn't be encouraging everyone to go to college because college is not for everyone. You know, this should be trade. And there's some validity to that too. So th th those are the two categories of pushback I get on what I think is a very simple message, which is that if you really have a, something you want to do, it doesn't mean start a company. You know, it could just be, I want to get a better job or I want to try and live in the city rather than living out in the suburbs, or I want to have my own apartment, not by sharing it. 
all those things are solvable if you're willing to start and try and figure it out rather than dreaming about it or rubbing oh, out the first roadblock and turning away. Yes. I love what you just said at the end there, especially all of it's possible if you believe in your ability to figure it out. Like I, I, I often say to myself that it's dangerous to believe that you know the way. Because if you know the way in your mind, you try that particular way. And if it doesn't work, you catastrophically come apart. Like, well, I, I can't do it then because that way didn't work. That job, that, 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 that endeavor. But instead, if you just believe in your ability that I will find a way rather than the way. And I believe in my ability to figure it out. I totally agree with that. That's amazing. Awesome. Everyone stands at the beginning of the trail going like this, trying to see around the corner. Yeah. And if you, and there's, and they're there for years, I yeah. don't want to start because I can't see where it goes. <laughs> well, Jesus walk 50 feet and then you'll see down the trail and you'll go and another walk another 50 feet, you know, just yeah. start, start. There's so there's been so many gems, diamonds <laughs> in the rough, honestly, <laughs> Thanks, in this conversation. Uh, I, I echo so many of the things that you shared today, Mark. Um, I, I literally, yeah, it's like almost like this, like cliche. I, I, I literally could talk to you for hours because <laughs> I, you know, I could go business, philosophy, work, life, everything. Um, such a treat to speak to you. And I think, um, I think the listeners are going to love it. And, uh, and uh, yeah, uh, where, where if somebody wants to, to, to find out more about your podcasts, you know, where, where do they go and your book and all that? Yeah. I mean, it's a, a lot of the stuff we've touched on today are things that I do try and expound on at length in actual coaching sessions on the podcast. That's probably where I'd start. Uh, and of course it's everywhere you, everywhere you get your podcast from, but yeah. the other place is that uh, if you find out all those places where I, if, if the half an hour is too much for you and you want it carved up into blog posts or into tweets or an instant, whatever, markrandolph.com, Mark with a C, Randolph with a PH. That's all, that's ground zero for, uh, for the, the, uh, the media company, <laughs> the content network. I don't know what, what the hell you call it. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Mark, uh, genuine highlights of the week, well, of the month to speak to you. Thank you so much. My pleasure, Eric, and good luck with all of your challenges as well. But that's that's the fun. If it was easy, it wouldn't be as fun anymore. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Mark. See you then. Cheers. I know you're going to absolutely love my next interview with Philip Stutz. You can find it right here. Just check it out. Click there. This is a man who helped win three presidential elections. You're going to want to check out that discussion. I'll see you there. Click the link.